pretty much think of this as a public health pandemic. 6.7 million Americans and counting. They say if nothing's done, 131 million people worldwide will have Alzheimer's. I mean, that's, it's, it just is astounding. Caregivers shouldering a mounting physical, mental, and emotional load. But don't you remember me? Don't you remember this? And the cost of caring for patients is skyrocketing. There are billions and billions of dollars estimated to be trillions uh, 25 years from, from now. New treatments are on the horizon, but some say action is needed now. And we are fighting to make sure that every family has access. In the battle against Alzheimer's disease, we are all on the front lines. I'm not going to stand by and wait till it catches me. I'm going to put up a fight. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Pastrana and tonight we are illuminating Alzheimer's, shining a light on what many consider a long, dark goodbye. Alzheimer's disease is progressive, mild memory loss that gets worse over time. Families describe it as grieving their loved ones while they're still alive. For me and so many others, it's personal. My own grandmother and great grandmother had Alzheimer's disease. I watched as my grandfather, my mother, my aunt and other relatives all stepped into the role of caregiver, an emotionally daunting task when you think about it. And I often do think about them and their sacrifice. I know there are millions more out there just like them, and that's why we are illuminating Alzheimer's. Suri Velez considers herself the family memory keeper. She has hard drives filled with photos and she can rattle off stories from childhood. But she's also living with the fear those memories may fade faster than anticipated. At 56 years old, Suri Velez is living with Alzheimer's disease. Constantly forgetting something and constantly repeating myself. Same story over and over again. Now the story Suri Velez is sharing is her own in hopes of raising awareness for Alzheimer's disease. I actually got diagnosed at 52, but I already had seen the signs since I was 50. They did a bunch of cognitive tests. I failed them. Then they did the MRI and they did the PET scan. And the PET scan confirmed that I already had the amyloid starting in the front lobe. When you got the official diagnosis, what was your feeling. What was oh your reaction? Gut-wrenching. I was like, I'm going down the same lane. I'm going down the same path. My father's path, my grandfather's path, my grandmother's um, path. I, w I was going down and I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to stand by and wait till it catches me. I'm going to put up a fight. Alzheimer's runs in Surrey's family. Her father and paternal grandmother both had it. On average, most patients are over 65. Her father was diagnosed at 62 years old. In the beginning, obviously, it's the little forgetfulness stuff, but you know, then it went to the next level of losing his car in the parking lot or driving around and not remembering how to get back home. I mean, one day he took the boat. He got on the boat and he took off. And he calls and my mom and says, I don't know how to get back. How do we find them? It eventually progresses and it gets worse and it, it gets to literally, I mean, I saw my dad go into a child stage, complete and total child stage. But there were those lucid moments, just split seconds that he would sit there and he was like, I don't want to live like this anymore. Kill me. And what do you do? Can't do anything. But then he was gone. He would forget that he would just said that. You know, those little moments, I, I don't want to get to that point. Do you worry about when you might reach that stage? If I start worrying about it, I'm going to not stop crying. So how do you stay positive? I have to do it for my girls. I can't leave it so that they have to be caring for me. Suri has vowed to fight. In fact, her fight started before she was even officially diagnosed. Because of her young age, it was difficult to get the testing to confirm Alzheimer's. So she found a study through Facebook. 
and now as part of that study, she receives weekly injections. But it's a blind study, so she doesn't even know what she's taking, but she thinks it's working. The studies are not fun, they're, sometimes they're painful, but that is better than the alternative. And if, I, if that's what I have to do, if every week I have to, you know, show up to the study and get shots or whatever, I will do it. Because I'm not gonna just sit, you know, sit idly and wait till it catches up to me. I have seen an improvement. And, you know, I don't wanna get my hopes up very high because I don't wanna be disappointed either. But I do see an improvement in what I remember. Is it frustrating to not know or you're just like, hey, it's I working? I really don't care. I honestly don't care. I will take whatever you give me. So long as it saves my life and my memory and my brain, I will take whatever you give me. Because like I said, the alternative is worse. It's that alternative experts around the globe are trying to avoid for as many patients as possible. And much of the research on the topic is happening right here in South Florida. Scientists at UM and FIU hope they're on the brink of promising new discoveries. We know a lot compared to when I started in, in Alzheimer's, but it's like exploding now. Dr. Margaret Parachak Vance has been studying Alzheimer's disease for more than four decades. The University of Miami geneticist led a team at Duke in 1993 responsible for the groundbreaking discovery that a common genetic variant known as ApoE4 increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. She's currently the director of the Miller School's John P. Hussman Institute for Human Genomics. So one of the things we want to do here, because in the past, you have people who are looking at social determinants of health and the people doing genetics, when the, really the answer is to bring them together. Statistics show Hispanic and African American populations are at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's, but it's not just about genes. Then it has to be some of these other things, some of these, you know, health disparities, access to health care, um, stress, uh, all these other things that that become, you know, in increasingly important and that we need to study and we have to understand. The major risk factor is age, aging, right? Um, certainly genetics, we know that there's certain genes that confer increased uh, uh, risk uh, for many of the genetic diseases. And then scientists began to realize that you live in an environment that you expose to many different things. And so uh, now, today, gene environment interactions are clearly a topic of great interest in the context of neurodegenerative diseases. At Florida International University's Stemple College of Public Health and Social Work, Dean Tomas Guilarte's lab is bustling with students studying the brain. He's done extensive research on specific proteins like amyloid, tau, and TSPO, and what role they play. If we delete this protein, actually it looks like it may slow down the progression of the disease. Now, if that turns out to be the case, that would be an important discovery because there are drugs that we can use to target this protein and potentially uh, do the same thing. So this is one of the types of work uh, that, that is being done uh, here. Do you think that we are getting to crisis level with Alzheimer's? Uh, we're already there and the projections are even worse. Um, we pretty much think of this as a public health pandemic. And we don't use that word lightly after what we've gone through with, with COVID. But if you look at the number of individuals we have now and you're projecting to, to 2040, we're talking about at least a tripling uh, people with Alzheimer's. Dr. Jason Richardson works with Dr. Guilarte at FIU's Brain Behavior and the Environment Program. He says new research indicates DDE, which is found in the environment as a result of the now banned insecticide DDT, can affect the brain even at very low levels. What we found was that uh, if you were above a certain level of a very persistent pesticide metabolite called DDE, uh, you are more than four times as likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. The population is aging and we need to do a good job to take care of ourselves as we age and to take care of our, our aging loved ones. So I think everyone should be uh, understanding that as a society, we are moving into an era that we've never had to experience before. 
And back at UM, Dr. Rosie curiel Sid with the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and Aging has developed a cognitive stress test to detect mild impairment at the earliest stages of the disease. And she says there's progress being made on blood tests that would make diagnosis much easier. The technological advancements have allowed us to now be able to detect these proteins like uh, amyloid and tau in the blood of individuals. And this is transformative for the future because individuals can uh, access, if, uh, once, you know, once the science leads us there, the, the goal would be that individuals can access faster diagnosis and be able to make decisions about their life well before they're impaired. The experts are in agreement. Right now, early detection is key. But getting an Alzheimer's diagnosis isn't always easy. Researchers at a South Florida clinic say a simple eye exam may help bring your brain health into better focus. People have said the eyes are the window into the soul. Well, the eyes are a direct look into the brain. You can literally see brain cells by looking in the back of the eye. Dr. Richard Isaacson is a preventive neurologist and clinical researcher at the Institute for Neurodegenerative Diseases of Florida in Boca Raton. When we started looking in the back of the eye, we started seeing different patterns, different patterns of the nerve cells. It's called the retina and the nerve fiber layers. And literally, in a two-minute test, we could take a picture of the back of the eye, and the patterns and the, and the architecture or the backgrounds of the eye look different in a person that has no symptoms, a person that has mild symptoms, and a person that has severe dementia symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. A study published earlier this year in the journal Acta Neuropathologica looked at retinal and brain tissue samples from human donors at different stages of mental decline and found changes in the retina correlated to changes in the brain's memory hub. Dr. Isaacson says if we're able to identify the disease in its early stages, people can make brain healthy choices to control their modifiable risk factors. If we can diagnose early and diagnose meaning what the risk factors are, what the pathology is before symptoms begin and we can give that person a targeted risk reduction plan throughout their life course over decades, that prevention will be that person's cure. To that end, there's a new research study opening up this summer that can be done from the comfort of your own home and phone. You can go to retainyourbrain.com to sign up. The goal of the study is to help people learn ways to reduce their risk of Alzheimer's disease in a way that's tailored to them. And we're trying to, again, democratize care. If we can offer a low cost, easily accessible, um, you know, risk reduction software, risk reduction education, uh, that's really what we're trying to do um, and to help these populations in need. Alzheimer's is, is scary. Alzheimer's is serious, but there's hope. There really is hope. Patients aren't the only ones coping with the debilitating effects of Alzheimer's disease. For their loved ones, a diagnosis often means taking on the role of caregiver. We'll hear some of their stories next. Welcome back to our special report, Illuminating Alzheimer's. According to the Alzheimer's Association, there are an estimated 827,000 unpaid caregivers in Florida. But as we found out, their free care comes at a cost. With more than 66% of caregivers reporting their own chronic health conditions and nearly 30% suffering from depression. Yvette Terra and Ashley Alvarez have a lot in common. They're both the youngest of four siblings. They're both passionate about animals and their careers, and they're both caregivers for aging parents with Alzheimer's disease. I put myself in his place. How would I want to be treated if I had that disease? And so that is the way I treat him. Definitely a lot of respect, a lot of respect towards her, um, especially as a former, former caregiver herself. Ashley's mom, Mirta, is a retired school teacher adored by her students. She once cared for her own mother with Alzheimer's disease. Now bedridden, Mirta was diagnosed about nine years ago. Ashley was in college at the time. I actually had to ask for three incompletes my last semester of my master's program because um, I was entering my summer A, and that was when I started noticing my mom, my mom was trying to take the keys to go out, go out <clears throat> and get her cafe con leche from her favorite bakery and she no longer remembered. And she would come back with the car all scratched up. And I go, no, this is a danger to everybody and it's a danger to her. What kind of goes through your mind in those moments when you think my mom doesn't remember me? I actually recorded the first time 
that she ever said, tú no eres mi hija. Um, because I needed proof to show my family this is what's happening and she did everything for me and now I want to do everything for her, everything that I possibly can. And she always said that she wanted to give us everything that she never had and more and not want to be able to do that for her. Yvette Terra describes a similar sense of duty. Her father Aurelio was diagnosed 11 years ago. My dad is a character, you know, he is funny, he's very strong-willed, he's stubborn. You know, he has a, an, an amazing ability to love, but he can be stubborn and a handful when, he, you know, with or without al Alzheimer's. I was seven years old when my parents divorced and um, all of my siblings and I stayed with my dad. So I was raised, they were already grown up, they were, you know, in their teens and, and pushing 20. And um, so I was always with my dad. So I just think, you know, it, it, you're supposed to honor your father and your mother. And that's just what we're doing is giving back to him because he gave so much. So you feel like you're returning the favor? So I think, say. yeah, I think not only returning the favor, but I'm, I'm a person of big faith. So I believe that it's what God wants me to do. According to the Alzheimer's Association, in 2022, caregivers nationwide provided an estimated 18 billion hours of unpaid care. Approximately two-thirds of caregivers are women, and one-third of dementia caregivers are daughters. And like so many others, both Yvette and Ashley had their own health issues to deal with. I went into a depression. I had to go on antidepressants, and having to, to, to go through that was probably the worst part of my life. Five years ago, I suffered a brain hemorrhage, and surprisingly, who was at my bedside every day was my dad. You know, um, <laughs> Uh, he was there every day in the hospital. I was in, in a coma and the whole, the whole thing. Um, but even in the midst of that, again, we had a plan. Lisette Valois is a social worker with the Institute for Neurodegenerative Diseases of Florida. She helps patients and caregivers navigate what life will look like with Alzheimer's disease. It is difficult and sometimes we forget who we are as caregivers and we give everything, all our efforts and support to the other individuals and we um, forget about who we are. She speaks from experience, having cared for a loved one with a serious illness and memory loss. She says help is out there in the form of support groups, counseling and respite care. We're here to support you emotionally and psychologically only if you are willing to be support. So it's so important for if, you know, your, your viewers have someone in their life, you know, or come across somebody in their life, you know, educate yourself about Alzheimer's. Before you can help, you have to understand the disease. You have to understand what that person is going to. What's your advice to people just beginning the, the caregiver journey? Be patient, be kind to yourself, and be kind to them. And seek help. Un beso. There is no cure for Alzheimer's disease, but there are treatments that have shown promise in slowing symptoms and improving quality of life for patients. And one medication is on the verge of full FDA approval next month. I spoke with doctors to learn more about what's on the market, what's still in the works, and whether it's worth the risk. I have the hopes that I am on the medication because I do see, I do see improvement. Remember Suri Velez? She's part of an Alzheimer's clinical trial in which she receives medication every week. Or does she? It might be the placebo she doesn't actually know, but she's hopeful. So long as it saves my life and my memory and my brain, I will take whatever you give me. Are we close to any breakthroughs? I think that we're close to breakthroughs. A lot of the research that we're focusing on, a lot of it is in the same area, which is in monoclonal antibody therapy. Earlier this year, the FDA granted accelerated approval for lecanemab for patients with mild cognitive impairment. Last month, drug maker Eli Lilly released findings that showed its monoclonal antibody therapy, donanemab, quote, significantly slowed cognitive and functional decline in phase three study. Dr. Rafi Wald with the Marcus Neuroscience Institute at Baptist Health's Boca Regional Campus says these types of treatments target abnormal bodies in the brain, such as the beta amyloid protein. But there are some pretty serious side effects. So when you introduce these medications into a person's brain, what happens is they attack all of those bodies, including the ones that are attached to the blood vessels. Mm. Okay, When you attack those bodies and you destroy them, 
it can leave a hole in those blood vessels, which causes them to bleed into the brain, which is also very damaging. While it might be working on that beta amyloid that's accumulating in the brain, and, and again, that's an advancement, it may not necessarily change the way that they're functioning in their day-to-day -day life. Medicare and Medicaid don't currently cover these very expensive drugs. Dr. Rosie curiel sid at the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and Aging at the UM Miller School of Medicine says we should proceed with caution. I think that, you know, one of the things that we need to also consider is before payer sources move forward with making this uh, very widespread is the level of risk that it may have in the general population. I think that that is something that needs to be further um, carefully thought through before this drug is made widely available. Other medications on the market for years have been found to give patients some extra time of improved functioning. But as far as a long-term solution, you have to start years before you even suspect any symptoms. Exercise, okay? With the approval of your doctor, you're gonna walk. Walking is so important. It keeps your blood vessels healthy, it keeps your heart healthy. So I strongly encourage everybody to walk. Yes, doing puzzles and playing games on your phone and reading is important, that's very important, but much more important than that is managing your vascular health. The brain is the best protected organ in the body, but as we know, it's not immune to injury or disease. Part of its protection is called the blood-brain barrier. Very little gets in and very little gets out. But local doctors are developing a way to open that barrier in hopes of helping Alzheimer's patients. The blood-brain barrier stays open for a day. This device may one day be an integral tool in stopping Alzheimer's in its tracks. It's called the Exablate, and it's part of a non-invasive clinical trial happening in South Florida, currently screening patients. Dr. Shea Moskowitz is the medical director of neurosciences at Broward Health. By using uh, ultrasound, low-frequency ultrasound, targeted at small areas of the brain where the amyloid is deposited, can disrupt the blood-brain barrier. By opening that blood-brain barrier temporarily, we allow things to get in and things to get out. Continue to do that repetitively, the amyloid burden can go down, and in theory, that will alter the course of the disease. We know that it's a coming tidal wave of uh, a medical condition, which by 2050 will overwhelm existing medical services, and there's no known effective treatment, medical or surgical, to date. And that's why this technology may be a game changer. Dr. Michael McDermott is the chief medical executive at Miami Neuroscience Institute at Baptist Health, also studying disruption of the blood-brain barrier. Um, ultimately, the goal, I think, down the road would be to combine um, this um, low-intensity focused ultrasound with a drug because we know that opening the barrier will allow drug to get into the brain uh, whereas in a normal situation without that disruption, the drug won't get in. Both doctors are hopeful this research can one day help in the treatment of other illnesses, including cancer and addiction. Because Alzheimer's disease is so profound sociologically, economically, mentally, emotionally, it's a very big target for everything that we can do to try and impact it. So Alzheimer's disease is a logical, great place to apply this technology, but, but it will not be the only place that it gets applied. When we come back, how you can make a difference. Stay with us. Together, we've learned a lot about Alzheimer's, but education without action can feel useless. And that's why organizations like the Alzheimer's Association are here to raise awareness, funds, and the red flag to let lawmakers know change is needed. We finally actually started what we would call the era of treatment. But right now, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have actually denied the coverage of one of the some of the latest treatment. It's a frustrating reality for patients and their families. Experimental drugs come with serious risks and aren't covered by insurance, and even FDA-approved therapies can be prohibitively expensive. We are fighting to make sure that every family has access. And it's important because there are 2,000 people every day that are crossing that threshold that are not no longer eligible for this type of treatment because Medicare is blocking it right now. So, you know, stepping up and giving your voice and being a part of the solution means really being able to make sure 
that families get access to care, that, you know, more research is happening in this field. Alexander Levy is the director of the Walk to End Alzheimer's Miami. For people who are watching and thinking, well, you know, I don't have a history of this in my family. This doesn't affect me. It does. Why? Tell them why they should care about Alzheimer's disease. Well, absolutely. It is a huge impact on our, on our workforce. Not only is it that 62,000 folks here in, my, in Miami-Dade County already have this disease, two-thirds of those uh, individuals are women. The black community is twice as likely and the Latin community is 1.5 times as likely to have Alzheimer's disease than their white counterparts. So this is a disease that affects the entirety of our community. Last year, Governor Ron DeSantis visited Broward Health to sign the Ready Act, ramping up education of Alzheimer's disease and dementia for you. This year's state budget included additional funds for awareness and research, as well as $1 million in funding for the Florida Alzheimer's Center of Excellence. The real goal for this is that we want to make, make sure that families can spend more time with their loved ones. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has said it would cover lecanemab under certain guidelines once it gets official FDA approval, which is expected next month. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining us for this important half hour all about Alzheimer's disease. The education and conversation doesn't end here. We have more on our website, cbsmiami.com. On behalf of my family and in honor of others impacted by Alzheimer's disease, I'm Lauren Pastrana. Good night.